All right, guys, uh, let me just double check, make sure we're recording properly. I think we are. Yes, we are, good. So welcome, it's Wednesday, uh, October 21st. It's been quite a week for, for all of us probably now that we're, we're back to the remote learning stuff. Um, certainly been a busy week for us and in our household we had to put down our our 19 and a half year old cat yesterday uh, which is never easy regardless but uh, particularly tough with a, an animal you've had with you for nearly two decades and uh, so yeah we, we've been going through it a little bit this week ourselves and now now Corbin's gone to the gone back to the remote model out of necessity and I know there are there are a number of different factors, but one of those is carelessness by certain individuals and groups on campus when it comes to the protocols that, that everyone has been asked to follow. And, and now here we are, so I guess we should all take lessons about, you know, trying to, to actually follow through and obey some things and limit the damage. But uh, hopefully this will be a, a short-lived deal, and, and if we're lucky, we'll be back on a rotation schedule starting on Monday the 26th, I guess that would be. But I'll be waiting for word on that, as will you, I'm sure. I do not know. For the immediate future, we're gonna be doing remote learning, and, uh, and, and I'm going to be doing it vis-a-vis -vis the asynchronous recording model. So um, just real quickly, a word on that. I have gotten in every single one of my classes, I've been receiving a few emails. Um, I've, I've gotten nearly 20 emails so far between last night and this morning telling me what, uh, you, know, you know, requesting that I change my model and do things differently than I've decided to do them, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and I'm, I'm happy to respond to those. Um, you know, graciously and diplomatically as, as I should, and that's fine. But in order to maybe head off any, you know, any further few dozen emails, um, I, I've actually thought this through. There are reasons. There are extenuating circumstances as well with technology um, and, and the, uh, some of the hitches and glitches that we've experienced with the integration of technology from our homes with the synchronous model and also synchronous models with recording um, and uh, among other faculty, I would be included in this. We've had a number of, um, you know, number of glitches with making that operate properly. And so I'm partially for that reason, but also very much for the reason that I have bunches of students who, when we go to the remote learning, to the solely remote learning model, they, uh, the commuter students who are living at home, they, as I said during the wildfires, uh, when that happens, the wildfires complicated things even more. But regardless, for commuter students who are at home, one of the major challenges they have, of course, is that they're, they're juggling access to computers in their home with either another sibling or their parents or whatever it is. And just balancing that out with class, with scheduled class times on scheduled days can be a real bear. So the recording, uh, you know, the, the way I'm doing this, the asynchronous model with the recordings that are posted uh, to our Populi page, that helps to alleviate some of that burden. And that's, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm doing it. But for those who are you know, who are requesting that I do the recordings plus the synchronous. Uh, we, we've just had some issues with that, especially uh, many profs trying to do it from home with, with shared Wi-Fi um, in areas. It's been a bit of an issue sometimes. So I'm bypassing technical hangups and just going streamlined. We'll do this for at least the next few days. If for some reason um, we are not back on campus with regular rotations by next Monday or Wednesday, and if the word comes that in fact we're just going to stay completely remote through the rest of the semester, um, I'll I'll think about some things. I'm not promising that I'll change, you know, change to an, uh, a synchronous model, but I I will at least reconsider some things and and uh, put some fresh lenses on, see if there's something else, but. 
for at least the foreseeable few class periods, we're gonna stay with the asynchronous model so you can look for recording links to be posted to the course website. Uh, and just so I don't forget right now, um, remember that we have on Friday, the Roman set one video um, selections are due. So if you're in Roman set one, you're gonna be submitting your video your video link to me, just vis-a-vis -vis my Corbin email is fine. You don't need to put that on the Populi site. I'm gonna take that link and I'm gonna put it into the discussion session section on our course page in Populi. But just send me the YouTube link to my Corbin email and I will verify that it, that it actually works and then I will post it to the Populi page. But I'm looking forward to those. We have a few, uh, you know, I have, I think five, it's either five or six that are submitting video bios. So that'll be fun for, for me to watch, but also I want you guys to, again, make sure that you go through and watch those. Uh, I will, um, I'll send you a note about it as well, but everyone in the class, I want you to, over the next seven to 10 days, you are responsible for going through and watching each of those video bios and taking some notes. And I will draw from, from those video bios when we get to the final exam. So, so you're obviously responsible for the material presented. Also, if and when we do come back to campus on Monday or Wednesday or whenever it will be, we're gonna be with group B rotation. So as soon as we come back, whenever that is, we're gonna come back if you're in group B, you guys are in the classroom and group A would be in the Zoom room, okay? So whether we're back on Monday or whether we're back on Wednesday or next Friday or whatever it's gonna be, it's gonna be group B that starts off with the rotation. Okay, so let's get to, let's get to this era of Roman history, one of the more fascinating ones that we've, that we've been delving into. By the way, I, I keep telling my classes, I've got, I've got my Bruce Tartan bow tie here. I'm just I'm trying to, you know, here I am at my home. It's where we're asynchronous, but I'm trying to, trying to look professional for you still. I should get some, I should get some student points for that or something. I don't know. You can, you can tell my, my dean or something. I don't know. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the, the end of Sulla's reign because it has some dramatic bearing on where we're headed here. Sometime during the period in in his life around 82 to 80 BC, Sulla was uh, in mid 82 BC, if, if I'm recalling correctly. Sulla was appointed dictator, an office that he was, um, an office that had kind of fallen out of favor, to be honest, and had, in many respects, I think, lain dormant, probably the way I would put it, since the Hannibalic War, since the Second Punic War. Sulla modifies the dictatorship a little bit. Um, let me move this. He, he modifies this a little, I'm trying to get a little bit more comfortable, but stay in camera here. There we go. Sometimes you think you have everything set up just right and then you discover, nope, not quite. It's pretty close, but not exactly where I want things to be. So Sulla changes the dictatorship as he understands it just a little bit. Uh, he was to, to essentially hold the post, not for the traditional six months or thereabouts, uh, but for as long as he wanted. Uh, that's the stipulation that he makes. And, and he took as his specific dictatorial assignment the exceptionally broad task of um, essentially writing laws and and organizing the Roman state, I mean, giving himself an awful lot of, of authority to, to dictate here. Sulla then used his new power to essentially redraft the government of Rome. So he's issuing all sorts of legislation. But the interesting thing is that you'd expect that Sulla was, I mean, he's obviously engaged in some pretty disturbing there we go. He's actually, he's obviously engaged in some pretty disturbing acts to this point. The purges that we talked about on Monday uh, being critical in all of this.
but you know, you'd expect Sulla at this moment perhaps to kind of keep moving in this radicalized direction, um, you know, this, this progressive radicalized direction, but he, he doesn't really do that. And I don't know that it's, you know, entirely because of some element of conscience that got to, to Sulla at this late stage of his life. I think it's a little bit more simplistic than that. I think he, he realizes that there is some, uh, you know, maybe some power and purpose to some of the traditions that, that many had bypassed or that many had canceled out, including him in previous years. So he, one of the things he is trying to do is to reverse the trend toward the popularist government that I was talking about on Monday. And, you know, it's not that every one of these new pieces of legislation is, you know, is horrible or, um, or, or that there isn't a fair amount of legitimate thought put into it. I think there is some. Um, what I would say is that Sulla's reorganizational concepts are largely reactionary. They're largely based on trying to you know, mollify those in Rome who are, um, you know, who are kind of fence riders, kind of wondering where they should land. There's this, there's this association where uh, he's, He's kind of muzzling the the tribunes, the the tribal assembly, for example. Ex tribunes were were debarred from holding any other office and could not propose legislation as a result of some of the, the reforms here that Sulla is pushing through. So he's either gaining more loyalty from those who were fence riders or already loyalists, or he's punishing the, you know, in very partisan fashion, he's punishing those who are his political enemies, and those who he thinks could threaten his power. So he is essentially reforming the Senate, expelling many of its members and installing um, most of the newcomers being loyal to him. He even, he tried to prevent army commanders from doing what he had done, realizing, of course, that he'd pulled it off perhaps, but that didn't, that didn't mean that he wanted others to try to to do the same thing and then come after him. So, so he prevented army commanders from doing the same thing. He also issued other regulations uh, when it came to the military, many of which stood for about two or three decades, such as his establishment of um, courts of inquiry within the military sector itself, sort of like a, you know a, a Roman a late Republican version, Roman version of our courts martial in the United States, but, but one that, uh, you know, is overseen by those loyal to Sulla during his lifetime. In 79 BC, his, his legislative redrawing was basically completed. Sulla resigned his dictatorship at that point, you know, happy that he'd completed his, his self-assigned tasks. He retired, and then about six and a half months later, he died. <laughs> uh, and, you know, not a big surprise here. There weren't a whole lot of mourners at Sulla's funeral. He was obviously not one who endeared himself to late Republican Rome. Which brings us to Gaius Julius Caesar, of course, one of the most important Romans of all time. So this is titled The Last Days of the Roman Republic from Caesar to Augustus, from Julius Caesar to Augustus Caesar, right? And, you know, let's just get our bearings with, with Gaius Julius Caesar. You see the years of his lifespan from 100 to 44 BC. He's born into a, uh, not only a, a patrician family, but a, a, patric a, a, a patrician family of particular note. Apparently I cannot speak in the late afternoons for some reason. So a, a particularly um, monumentally important patrician family that claimed to have some very extraordinary ancestors. I, I say claim because you'll see in a moment that, that we're dealing with some, some myths and legends here. The first of which, you know, the, the first ancestor they, they claimed lineage, direct lineage with was Aeneas, who, you know, the son of, of Venus and Anchises. Aeneas being the subject of Roman mythology as, as far as this, this originator, this 
uh, you know, this original, her original heroic founder of Rome. The other ancestor, of course, was Romulus, Rome's, Rome's technical founder, Romulus, who raised by a she-wolf, kills Remus and founds Rome. So Julius Caesar's family claims this you know, this mythological, this legendary associate, these two legendary associations. But there's more to it than that, of course. Uh, Caesar's family had established itself as um, a very, uh, you know, a very practically minded, perhaps, but a, a very, um, a very aggressive politically aggressive family line going back at least three or four generations. Julius Caesar's parents, grandparents, great-grandparents on down the line, they had been uh, very well-respected and well-connected to the power elite in Rome going back a few generations. So this is probably the more important part of his family ancestry. So you go from mere aristocracy in a very real sense, when we talk about Julius Caesar, you go from mere aristocracy to this hereditary, you know, who's who, this hereditary legacy that's off the charts. He is truly a, you know, a Roman blue blood in every sense of the word. And, and even the, the cultural and political connections that Caesar's family could claim, you know, I bear some, you know, some, some heavy importance for us here. Julius Caesar's uncle, was uh, for a time served as a consul. Um, Julius Caesar's father served as a praetor, a very important position in its own right. Julius Caesar's aunt, uh, his aunt Julia, uh, actually was the wife of Marius, who we just talked about on Monday. So Julia was married to Gaius Marius in 110 BC thereabouts. And, and of course, you have another important element here. Not only do you have these family connections, you also have many by the time of Sulla's death. Sulla, Sulla becomes almost overnight as soon as he's gone. It, you know, there are efforts by some, I don't, you know, I wish this hadn't happened. There are some who make some efforts to kind of purge Sulla from the record, thankfully they were largely unsuccessful, so we still know an awful lot about what Sulla actually engaged in, but it does communicate the reality that Sulla had fallen into great disfavor with most Romans, with the vast majority anyway, and uh, so he's persona non grata once he is gone, which also means for us that those who specifically opposed Sulla, those, were on, those who had been placed on Sulla's list that were hunted down, that were either killed or expelled from Rome or what have you, they had kind of a, a chance here to re-engage and to you know, um, improve their family's state by you know, convincing the Roman Senate, among others, that they were worthy of the trust that Rome had once had in them. And, you know, you have this kind of rebirth process for a number of the more aristocratic Roman families who, for a time under Sulla, had fallen into disfavor and been hunted down. Julius Caesar's family is certainly one of these. And so the, fa the very fact that Julius Caesar himself had survived Sulla's purges Julius Caesar, remind you, even though he was a younger man, Julius Caesar was at the head, one of the, the critical people that Sulla had wanted to find and murder. And Caesar had been sent away from Rome into exile, essentially, and he'd survived Sulla's purges. And that actually proves to be this, this, um, you know, this huge draw, in a sense. Many people are, are impressed with Julius Caesar's family and their capacity to outlast the purges of Sulla. And he's very, by the way, Julius Caesar is very fortunate to have survived the, the reign of terror under Sulla because many did not. Um, there are upward of uh, 60 or 70 different patrician families, not individuals, but families who were targeted by Sulla. And uh, there were of the the patrician elite in Rome during the time period of Sulla's purges, you're talking about probably at least 150 or more who were in fact found and murdered. 
Uh, some put the number higher, a few, few lower, but it's probably around 120 or 30 or more, 150 perhaps or so, who were actually found in, and executed by Sulla's regime. So, not surprisingly, Julius Caesar, uh, you know, comes to this, you know, comes to this environment with not only high expectations from his family, from those who associate him with his family's hereditary background, he also comes to this moment in time with high expectations for himself. He's very well educated, coming from such a prominent Roman family. His, he completed his you know, the most important parts of, of what we would regard as his higher education in Greece until things settled down back in Rome once Sulla was finally gone. Julius Caesar has therefore a bit of an international background when it comes to his formative education, his formal education, his formal upbringing. Uh, he's a bit more of a cosmopolitan personality. He certainly understands the rules and regulations of Rome itself. He has enough respect for it. I, I'm being a bit facetious here because Julius Caesar's respect for Roman tradition is probably never the first thing on the list. Partially due, I think, to the fact that Roman traditions may have helped to bring in the dictatorship of Sulla. So Caesar is, is coming into this environment by the time we get to 80 BC, 80, 80 BC or 75 BC, that neck of the woods, He's, he's coming into this environment uh, you know, with a lot of expectation placed upon him. He is certainly, as we will see, he's a very aggressive personality. He certainly is eager to build a reputation and he's eager to have access to power and privilege that even his father and his uncles did not have. It helps that, oh, sorry where on the slide I, I wanted to be on. It helps that, you know, from, from what we know of Caesar, it helps that he was regarded as a very, uh, you know, very, very handsome and uh, some might say garish or showy personality. He was certainly that. I mean, uh, every time Julius Caesar is mentioned, even by some of his political enemies, they reference the fact that Caesar was in fact regarded, widely regarded as, as exceedingly handsome, especially as a younger man, but even at middle age, um, he was very showy. He liked to make a point of, of being the center of attention in just about every room he was in. He certainly demanded respect from his his officers, his lieutenants that served him under his command in Gaul, as we will talk about, but his enlisted men as well. But, you know, some, some historians have, have gone about this wrong, and they've then suggested that Julius Caesar's reputation is, is largely of, of his own construction, and therefore we should be, you know, almost completely doubtful and reserved when it comes to, you know, complementary or complementary elements regarding Julius Caesar. And I think that's the wrong approach. There's no doubt that Julius Caesar is a bit of a self-promoter there. Uh, there's very little reason to doubt that. But I would also say that, that self-promotion was an exceedingly common reality in ancient Rome. So if we're gonna charge Julius Caesar with being a self-promoter and then somehow demoting him, you know, as, as far as his legacy is concerned, his overall legacy, I. I think that's a dangerous and, and not useful, really not a very useful approach. Because then we'd have to, you know, start talking about a long, long list of Romans who really very much appear to have accomplished some, some important tasks and, uh, you know, and, and who have, albeit complex legacies, but some partially good legacies, we'd have to just kind of throw them all out as well. I don't think that's the way to approach it. He was a self-promoter to be sure, but, but let's be clear about something. Julius Caesar uh, was, was aware of the fact, probably because of the limits that his, his father, his uncles, um, the limits to their accession that he, that he was aware of. They had never been catapulted into the stratosphere with, with uh, power and authority 
the kind of power and authority that Caesar himself sought. And I think he understood this intuitively, that even though he had a lot of privilege at his background and he had these connections and he had a level of respect that was bestowed upon him simply because of his family, he understood that whatever he was going to accomplish also very much depended upon his, his intuition, his innovation, his dedication, and, and really Julius Caesar worked his tail off to become a, an unbelievably effective military commander. He became almost too effective as a politician, as we will see. He did fall in love with his own myth. There's, there's certainly, I think, some, some familiar territory for us here. He is reminiscent very much of, in a mythological sense, Achilles. He's reminiscent of Alexander the Great in this sense, kind of falls in love with his own legend, gets carried away with that, as we will see. So there's a prideful element that, that is very much part of Julius Caesar's life, and it, it very much contributes to his downfall. But I would also say that there's no way around the indicators of his genius. So uh, we have to balance these things pretty carefully. He's extremely resourceful. We'll see that not only his military career, we'll see that time and again when we talk about his political career. Some say that his defining characteristic is, is actually his ambition. Um, I, I think, again, I think we can get too carried away with that. You know, then, you, then it becomes tempting to say that the only reason he succeeded is because he was this manipulative genius and, and horribly ambitious and, you know, almost entirely unethical. For, we had this squawking bird outside my window. I don't know what, it, what its problem is, but uh, and now, I, you know, we don't have a cat to, to go and get it. So... If it doesn't stop the squawking, I, I, may have to, I may have to end its life myself, but we'll see. So, you know, I, I think it's important to keep a balanced perspective. Do I agree that Caesar was ambitious? Of course I do, there's no way around this. And, and actually there are few, if any, Roman leaders of any sector of Roman history where you wouldn't find a fair amount of distinct ambition being at the heart and core. So yes, he's definitely ambitious, but he is a mixture of all these things like most people are. And again, uh, I think the, uh, you know, I think the genius factor has to be thrown in there in, in order to understand what we ultimately see with this man. So what does he do? He, he wins renown. Hold on a second, I gotta have a map up on the screen. He wins renown as a junior officer in the, the Eastern campaigns, in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? So we've already talked about uh, the Mithridatic Wars, Mithridates, uh, the Roman, the, the Latin references. Uh, so this is true, this is, where, this is where Julius Caesar spends uh, a good part of his early career as a junior officer in the Mithridatic campaigns, he serves not only, not only faithfully, he serves with uh, particular acumen. He, he is actually in a, in a famous engagement um, not far from, from Thrace, actually. He's in a, a famous engagement there where he is captured. He he is brought into uh, the enemy commander's uh, tactical strategic command tent and questioned. He is, he is tortured a little bit. He ultimately escapes that, that capture, returns to his unit, and then leads uh, a, a contingent and, and defeats uh, a about uh, two different divisions of, of Mithridatic caval cavalrymen and infantrymen, a combined army unit, in a, a very effective uh, example of Roman legionnaire warfare, 
Julius Caesar wins renown as a result of that. There are some other campaigns he's also involved in. But one thing that's important here is that we never have to doubt that Julius Caesar possesses something that both the Greeks and the Romans prize, and that is definitely courage. Let's not, let's not cast him as just some politician with the right name and the wealth uh, you know, and the good looks and all these other things. Those may be true, but Julius Caesar was also an extremely courageous and a very dedicated Roman, very virtuous in this sense from the, from the Greco-Roman understanding of the term. So his, you know, his renown as a junior officer during the Mithridatic War is really crucial to all of this. But of course, this is all for, for Julius Caesar, it's the long game. He, he is, his ultimate intention is obviously not to just be a, uh, an officer in the Roman legions. It's not that that would be the worst thing in the world, but Julius Caesar has much bigger plans and he wants to, he wants to win renown in order to, to have that be a building block for his ambition. So he never gave up his desire to conquer Rome's Eastern holdings, but also wanting to return to Rome to be in the center of the Roman power structure. This is ultimately where he intends to be. So having, pr having proven uh, by 70, 75, 76 BC, having proven his virtues in war, Julius Caesar returned to Rome and he rallied support among opponents of the traditional political establishment. And I think this is a really critical thing. Remember when I said a few minutes ago that, that Caesar was, was first and foremost, Caesar was not a, a young man who, who was completely removed from the virtues of Roman political structure, Roman social order, and he wasn't completely opposed, in fact, to many of the Roman traditions. But what he understood intuitively was that breaking through into the power elite in Rome in, his, in this younger stage of life, in order to break in and break through, he was going to have to draw attention to himself. And the only way really to do that was to recast his image a little bit because of his family's heritage, because of his father and his uncles, be, because of all of that, the associations with Julius Caesar was that he was just another in a long line of very traditional Roman patricians. And Julius Caesar, you know, being the clever, clever young man he, he obviously was, Caesar decides to do a little bit of a, uh, you know, a recasting of his image when he returns from the Eastern campaigns. So he comes back in 76 BC and he runs, he starts to, to raise support uh, for you know, his, uh, you know, his eventual landing he starts with, you know, there's a praetorship and we'll see, he kind of progresses through the, to the consular ship and, and on down the line. So he, he, wanted to, he wanted to gain support primarily from the younger generations of Romans. And, and maybe those who were kind of, you know, on the fence here, maybe some who were, who had some more traditional loyalties, but were very much open to some, some avant-garde opinions and ideas, opinions, policies, etc. So he cultivated a person, personality style that, that, many, that many regarded as a little bit more radicalized, right? So he wore the newest fashions. He... He actually was a, a bit of a ladies' man. There are also some rumors of, uh, you know, he, he may have been, especially in his younger years, he may, may have been a bisexual. There are, there's all sorts of different stories on this, and I'm not going to weigh in on all of them. Uh, th there were rumors about, um, you know, being male lovers during his time in the army in these Eastern campaigns. Caesar uh, later said those were stories that were created by his political enemies. Uh, you know, so look, a um, lot of rumor and innuendo, not a whole lot of solid facts about some of those things. We do know this. We do know that he very much enjoyed the company of women and, and was, was in a lot of different uh, romances with them. And he 
he actually used that at this moment in time. He cultivated that image. So he's he's this guy with, you know, running around with a different woman probably every other week, um, wearing the newest fashions, the newest styles, um, using not the Roman highborn aristocratic speech, right? So his syntax, uh, even though he he obviously was most comfortable with you know the the patriarchy the 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 patrician class not that not just the patriarchy but this this highborn patrician class structure even though that was the reality he he liked to at this stage of time he started to use a lot of the uh the lowborn vocabulary and pronunciation and terminology and things like that and in in speeches and in interactions with people and so he's just creating this much more radicalized image of himself and he's doing it because he wants to to convince people that he's uh, this this futuristic visionary, this this young man who is going to to take Rome in new and necessary directions in the coming decades. It's actually, yeah, you know, it, the the interesting thing is that there's no indication anyway that he, he had anything like a you know a campaign advisor. Who is standing there telling him what to do when it comes to this stuff? He's making these decisions on his own, uh, which also speaks to some levels of of genius when it comes to Julius Caesar. So I want to flash forward to that map again. So what what happens to Julius Caesar? Well, one thing we do know is this. So by the time we get to uh, you know about 72 to 70 BC and Julius Caesar's reputation is on the rise and he's he's just kind of gearing up for you know some possible appointments here to uh, the the Roman power structure he's certainly you know he's he's serving as another rising star in the Roman Senate right so he's he's begun to build his own legend there's a problem that Julius Caesar encounters, and it's really a, a very straightforward one. It's, it's entirely financial. So Julius Caesar's family did have a fair amount of wealth, but his father had, had actually accrued some reasonably heavy debts, which he had, he had paid off. But in paying off those debts, he had, he had crippled parts of the family fortune, erased part of them, in fact, and left the young Julius Caesar in a bit of a precarious position. And he did, and one of the major issues here is that Julius Caesar did not wish to acknowledge, I think, that, that he could not spend freely and live as some highborn patrician, you know, as, as he believed a highborn patrician ought to live. And we do know, I mean, there there are still records of this, in fact. We do know that Julius Caesar just spent freely. He just, he wanted all the best clothes. He, want, he, he took trips to the various corners of the Mediterranean, the southern and eastern Mediterranean. Um, he was, he was with uh, a lot of different women and, and liked to you know, take them with him on some of these trips. He, he was spending an awful lot of money. He was spending a fortune and he was doing it very, um, you know, very consistently. And by the time we get to 72 BC, he was in deep trouble. <laughs> he, he, he was in deep crippling debt. The kind of debt that even a Roman patrician of his class, of his standing, was not likely to get out of without some some fortune coming his way without some help. So what does he do? Uh, he, he starts to find some very critical social and political allies. He allied first and foremost, we've got to talk a little bit about uh, his, his two uh, critical allies, one of whom was a genuine friend. So Marcus Licinius Crassus, typically just went by Crassus, uh, Crassus, by the way, if, uh, if you're looking for a connection point with him, he is the commanding general who was tasked with putting down the infamous slave rebellion led by Spartacus. Uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but um, I think we actually have one of our presenters who's dealing with, with the uprising in Spartacus, so I don't want to steal their thunder. 
but Crassus is associated with that episode. Julius Caesar befriends Crassus. They, they know each other from um, interactions in the Roman Senate. And, and Julius Caesar sees some value in aligning with, with Crassus, who ultimately becomes responsible for successfully putting down that slave rebellion. Crassus was outrageously wealthy, one of the most wealthy Romans of that era. Um, primarily, he accumulated his wealth through, slave, uh, through the slave trade, through mining operations. He was you know, a real estate mogul, all the rest. He was just, he was unbelievably wealthy. So that partnership, that friendship, Julius Caesar felt would be advantageous, and it proved to be. Uh, Crassus was named co-consul in 70 BC with the other guy on this screen, and that is Pompey. Uh, you know, some will tell you it's supposed to be pronounced Pompey. It really isn't. It can be. The, you know, sometimes there's an anglicized version, so it's not the end of the world. But technically, it's not supposed to be Pompey. It's supposed to be Pompey. Uh, so, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus Pompey the Great. Uh, his his Latinized name. And so 70 BC, the two co-consuls co-consul, are Pompey and Crassus. Crassus, for all of his wealth, Crassus was extremely envious of Pompey. And this is important because the three of these guys are going to be in a, a very, they're going to be playing a very dangerous game. Uh, Crassus is kind of in the middle on this in that he, he's genuinely a friend to both Caesar and Pompey. He respects them both. He's particularly envious of Pompey's uh, you know, political acumen and his capacity to maneuver in the political sense. Pompey himself is also a very capable military commander of, of some renown. Uh, and yet Crassus genuinely admires Julius Caesar, this, this up-and-comer who has obviously already had a fair amount of success. And so Crassus is kind of the mediator between these two powerful personalities, at least for a time. Pompey is, the, is ultimately going to be the key competitor to Julius Caesar. Uh, he spent the decade of, uh, you know, the, the late 60s on through the mid part of the 60s BC, I'm talking about Pompey here, he spent that decade commanding Roman legions abroad. Uh, so when pirates raided the, jump back to our, oops, map, where are you? There we go. So when pirates raided the Italian coast, uh, they actually kidnapped two Roman magistrates uh, who happened to be vacationing with their families in, in these coastal towns. So when the pirates came in, they took these guys. Uh, Pompey was, one of his major tasks was to go out and find the pirates and, you know, first of all, rescue the magistrates. He only got one of them back. But then he was given the charge of sweeping the Mediterranean and freeing it from these pirates, which he did uh, within about... Uh, 10 or 11 months, he was able to, to claim outright victory over these, these acts of piracy that were plaguing the Mediterranean and particularly plaguing the Italian people. And he engineered his own appointment as commander in chief all the way out east in the Mithridatic War that we have been referencing, these, these ongoing Mithridatic Wars, I should say. And that proves to be enormously important for Pompey as his own star continues to be kind of catapulting him into the stratosphere. So this is going to be, or it, it conceivably could be a problem for Julius Caesar that he has another challenge, he has a major challenger here in Pompey, someone who is, is building a very uh, well-regarded name for himself someone who is obviously going to be in direct contention with Julius Caesar for access to some of the power that Julius Caesar is seeking. So he's, Julius Caesar continues to groom his political career in the midst of all this, but obviously it's becoming a much more uh, iffy prospect. He's, one of the things that I think is clever here, I can't dig into it a whole lot. One of the things that Julius Caesar does, I think, to, to kind of balance his image, uh, his, his 
idea was, of course, to make himself appear to be this radical, visionary, new guy on the, you know, new kid on the block, so to speak, who, who comes into the Roman Senate, who's, who's, a, who's going to push Roman politics in a, in a new and progressive and, you know, different direction. Well, of course, what he realizes is that you can push that too far and it can actually lose you some support that you might have otherwise had. So he, he starts to moderate a little bit. And one of the things he does is he, he restores some public images and references with whom he has a connection, with, with whom his family had connections or with, he, with whom he still has connections. He restores uh, these, these things to their, their proper place in Roman society. And, and of course, the idea is that people will remember that he is actually part of a traditional Roman family. He's not just some new radical. So, you know, for instance, he restored uh, trophies of Marius's victories, uh, his military victories to prominence in and around the city of Rome itself. Uh, he held a pretty lavish funeral for his Aunt Julia, Marius's wife, when she dies. And the effort here is for Julius Caesar to, in essence, lay claim to Marius's political mantle himself and to, to convince people that, yeah, you know, I may have seemed, you know, seven, eight years ago, I may have seemed like I was just some new, new coming radical, but, but you know, I've learned some things since then. I still have some powerful visions for the future, but I can be trusted to respect Rome's traditions. He's successful in some of these efforts because he's actually elected praetor in 63 BC, Julius Caesar is. And you know, this is important because, you know, as, as uh, Mary Beard explains in the text, you know, you have these sequence of, or there's a typically a sequence of succession when you're, when you're going on up through the ranks of uh, the Roman power structure. And praetor was typically a very critical step for one to take and to achieve before you were able to ultimately stand for a consulship a few years after that. And that's, and that's another major step that Julius Caesar seeks to be, to be able to achieve a consulship in Rome. So the maneuvering for power by the time we get to 63 and 62 BC is critical and it helps to put this in, uh, in a proper framework. So from 60 to 53 BC, we have this triumvirate. Um, how, how is this happening? By, by 62 BC, Julius Caesar is in severe danger with his financial debts. He's, he somehow happens, he, he somehow has been able to milk his way along. And almost assuredly, this is because Crassus was his beneficiary for a while. Um, or was his benefactor, I should say, for a while. Almost assuredly, Crassus was helping Julius Caesar survive, at least. I don't, there's no indication that Crassus paid off debts, but that he was giving Caesar money to, to live is probably the reality. But by 62 and 61 BC, Julius Caesar is in deep, deep, deep trouble. So his financial problems forced Caesar to seek governorship of a province. He, he really didn't want to do this because if you seek governorship of a province, especially if you are appointed as governor of a province that's too far away from the power structure in Rome, you run the very real risk of removing yourself from the very power base you want to control. But he had no other choice. So he's appointed governor of Spain in 61 BC. So from 61 to 60 BC, he is the governor of Spain. Now, here, here's, without going and, and getting lost too much on a rabbit trail, I want you to understand. So you see, obviously, you all know where Spain is. Julius Caesar is the governor in Spain. He's actually there on site for almost the entire appointment. But you no, know, all indicators are that Julius Caesar wasn't spending nearly, nearly enough time or nearly as much time uh, overseeing policy and procedure and protocol and doing what any Roman governor was supposed to be doing, <laughs> uh, Julius Caesar was actually uh, making sure he was a profiteer. He was profiting from this position as much as possible. The evidence of this is pretty straightforward, in fact. In, in about a, 
a 15 month period thereabouts, he was somehow able to net enough money while being in charge as the governor in Spain to just to discharge all of his accumulated debts that had accrued over the previous 20 years, almost 20 years. And, and this allowed him to ultimately stand for consul in, in 59 BC. So the, the obvious question is this, how in the world does a, a guy who's, who's the Spanish governor, the Roman governor of Spain, I should say, of the province of Spain, how does, how does he accrue all this? Well, he was, he was running roughshod over some of the, of the more important Spanish families who, who had resisted Roman authority and under Julius Caesar's governorship, uh, he is obviously not only punishing them, he is stealing their family's wealth. Uh, the Roman legions are running through, are moving through some of these regions in southern and southern southeastern Spain. Uh, there is a there's a fair amount of plunder to be had. Caesar demanded, you know, elements of loyalty from his military commanders in those legions, and they were, you know, they're essentially paying. Uh, you know, this, I guess we'll call it sort of a political handler's fee to Julius Caesar during the course of those, you know, that, that year or so, a little bit over a year in Spain. So Julius Caesar gambles that he can serve as the governor of Spain and then return to Rome to stand for consul. And to his, you know, beyond his wildest expectations, probably it, it turned out better than he could have expected. And so he does, in fact, stand for consul in 59 BC. And that brings us to this, this first triumvirate. So this, this becomes a, this relationship from 60 to 53 BC becomes a, a politically essential move for, especially for Caesar and Pompey, although neither of these guys was particularly fond of the other even early on they ultimately become bitter enemies but even early on they, they weren't exactly close friends but this is a mutually beneficial relationship and here's why all three of these guys caesar pompey and crassus by 60 bc had fallen out of favor with with many members of the roman senate um, there were questions about how all, th all three of them had accumulated so much power and wealth, um, even Crassus. So Crassus, there were a lot who there were a lot of Roman senators who wondered how and why Crassus could possibly be as wealthy as he really was, and there were you know charges of corruption and and money being exchanged underneath the table, all sorts of things that that were sticking to Crassus and sticking to the other two as well. So all three of these guys had to kind of reestablish their reputations, but they also needed some really good support at this crucial juncture. So there is definite mutual benefit for having this partnership of the three of these dudes facing off against their enemies in the Senate. Um, and so the, the personal differences or the personal rivalries between Caesar and Pompey in particular, those are kind of put on the sideline for a time as the three of these guys uh, are, are mutually supportive, they're, they're trying to help one another increase their power base and their support network, and, and they actually engage in a fair amount of political subterfuge by having the, the enemies in the, Roman, in the Roman Senate who have been very you know, critical of them, they have you know, some trumped up charges created, they, they circulate stories, uh, in um, you know, in Roman circles on on the on the peninsula itself, they circulate stories that some of their political rivals in the Senate are are either corrupt or that they uh, have been uh, you know accepting money through corrupt circumstances. Obviously, that they have. There's a story that one one Roman senator is actually uh, had an affair with one of the barbarians on the fringe of the of the Roman um, Republic at the time and that therefore their loyalties are in question because maybe they are in league with the 
with the barbarian troops. There are all sorts of things that, that are beginning to happen. So the first triumvirate is, is actually very critical in understanding how Julius Caesar and Pompey and Crassus preserve and, ex and expand their power during this critical juncture. Caesar even goes as far as to do something that, that you know, many of us would regard as unthinkable, especially because you know, by 53 BC, for instance, he and Pompey, whatever the mutual benefit had been, it was beginning to crumble. There were certainly, there were, alre there were always cracks in this relationship, but um, by 53 BC, it was, it was basically, you know, falling apart, coming apart at the seams. Caesar actually arranged for his daughter, Julia, to marry Pompey. Uh, which ends up being a crucial component of the alliance. And it's a really important one for us to understand. It's almost unthinkable, of course, especially when you, when you think about the, when you realize how, how far apart these guys ultimately you know, move, they are definitely diametrically opposed when it, when it ultimately is weighed in the balance. But Julius Caesar for a time is so committed to this triumvirate and for the possibilities for his own future that he marries his own daughter, Julia, to, to the guy who becomes his most important political enemy in Rome. But ultimately this maneuvering works. Uh, you know, Caesar and, and oh, excuse me, Pompey and Crassus, both of these guys, they're their political and their financial clout is just is raised significantly. Caesar, you know, he, he certainly benefits from this financially, although he never becomes nearly as wealthy as Crassus. But Caesar is given, whoops, Caesar is given dominion over not one, but three provinces. So he's, he becomes the governor of not just one province, but three. Transalpine or uh, Transalpine Gaul, Gaul in southern France, uh, Cisalpine or Cisalpine, but it's typically pronounced Cisalpine Gaul, which is in northern Italy, north of the Rubicon, and Illyricum, which is present day Croatia. So you see that, you know, if you look on the map in the Adriatic Sea, you see Dalmatia to the directly to the east of Dalmatia, you see Illyricum. So Julius Caesar is given the governorship of three Roman provinces. And these provinces are important uh, because they are actually on the fringe of the Roman Empire in very critical parts. And it, it still leaves him close enough to Rome. If you think about, I mean, granted, if you're talking about Transalpine Gaul in southern France, that's a little bit further to travel but it's still not as far as Spain. And most of his time he spent actually in Cisalpine Gaul, Northern Italy, uh, and would occasionally traverse over to Southern Gaul. But the reality is this, as Julius Caesar commands these territories, he, he is able to retain some semblance of connection to the Roman power base that he intends to rule, or he intends to at least be a, a distinct part of. So this is, this is absolutely critical to understand. So we've got Julius Caesar, who's, who's governor of these three territories. Julius Caesar, uh, something you have to understand was when you're governing territories, you are, uh, many of these Roman governors are, um, are also serving as military commanders. This is certainly true of Julius Caesar. So he is, a commander, a general of Roman legions in these territories. After realizing that um, his that spending time in Cisalpine Gaul is his primary location, after realizing that there there is renown and wealth to be had if he recenters his operation into uh, Transalpine Gaul, this is where Julius Caesar moves his, his center of operations, and it really ends up being a critical move for him because uh, as Julius Caesar, uh, you know, one of the things that we know him for, in fact, 
other than the fact that he ultimately becomes, appoints himself dictator for life, which we're gonna talk about, and, and his assassination and all those things, Julius Caesar's legacy in a very positive sense is as this, this almost unequaled Roman military commander and his campaigns in Gaul really begin to secure his, found, secure the foundation for his ultimate legacy. So as Julius Caesar begins this time period at, you know, in, in 53 and 52 and, and 51 BC, his enemies are hoping that Julius Caesar, obviously his enemies are hoping that he'll, he'll be commanding legions in, in Gaul and that he'll be, he'll, he'll be killed perhaps in battle. But at the very least, they're hoping that he is ultimately embarrassed and that he fails in overseeing these three provinces of Rome these three new provinces, and, and that there's no way that Julius Caesar will ever be able to, you know, assume this mantle of authority that he has sought. So his political enemies are, are actually hoping, oh, this is a, let's get this guy out of town and hope that he's either killed or that he fails, and then our problem is solved. And the exact opposite happens, as we will see. All right, guys, that's where I'm going to leave off, and then on on Friday, uh, you'll have another, uh, probably, in fact, I'll probably post it late tomorrow afternoon or evening. Uh, you'll have access to another link to the second half of this presentation. But for now, that's where we're gonna stop it. And uh, obviously, I want to make sure that you watch this. So uh, you'll, you'll probably have access to this once, once I provide you with the YouTube link a little bit later this afternoon. And, and I want you to make sure that you watch that. So. Hope you're doing well. We'll reconnect pretty soon. Again, for those of you who are in Roman set one, your video bios, those links have to be sent to me by 5 p.m. on Friday. And everybody else, just make sure you continue to stay up to speed with the reading. And remember that we have the, the Roman, the new Roman history book coming up that you guys have to not only read, but most of you have to compose a review on. So these are all things that are that are coming into the wheelhouse pretty quickly. So just make sure you don't lose track. All right, have a good rest of your day. See ya.